What's up? You're about to see an exciting game that I played against Fabiano Caruana. This is a Blitz game. Fabiano is playing white. He's the three times US champion who played the World Championship match against Carlson. But this time it's just a friendly Blitz game. I'm playing black. Fabiano starts off with an unusual opening. Sometimes people do that just to drag their opponent into unfamiliar territory and give them some space to think and to burn time, because in Blitz it's important. So the opening is slightly unusual, but anyway, white occupies the center. I'm doing the same. Now white goes pawn e5, attacking this pawn on f6. And let me ask you to think about this position for a second. I think it's going to be interesting if at times I'll ask you to think about that so that you can compare your way of thinking with the Grandmaster's way of thinking and hopefully learn some useful tricks about this. Okay. Now, the initial impulse of a player when his piece is attacked is just to move it away somewhere. But if you've been a part of the Igor Nation for some time, you know that offense is the best defense, right? So we counter-strike. Pawn to d4. Now I decided to take here, I recapture the knight just as well, and at this point white has a choice of which pawn to take. He can recapture here, here, or here. And out of these three options, uh, Karana chose to take here on g7, which looks like a good option from human perspective, because it uh, weakens black's skin side and black is anticipated to castle there, so the king will be weaker. But computer doesn't like this move, and it says that basically Either of the two other options were better, either to take here or here, and that would lead to an equal game. But pawn takes g7, strangely enough, actually turns out to be rather bad for white. Now black has this powerful bishop that operates across this long diagonal, and black is in fact threatening to capture the pawn on b2. And white cannot recapture really, so he played pawn to b3. White can't take here because then black recaptures with a double attack to white's pieces, therefore that's bad for white, and instead he played pawn b3. But now the problem is, thanks to this pawn on c3, black's got some space advantage, and white's position is slightly cramped. For instance, this bishop can't get out normally because of this pawn. Anyway, the game goes on, so I develop. So far, it's just normal development from both sides. I castle king side, white does the same. And here, by the way, this is a really funny position because this position officially breaks Stockfish. If you turn on Stockfish and let it think for some time, it just goes nuts. And after some time, with all the seriousness, says that the best thing Black can do is to undevelop this bishop back to c8. So like, somehow we are able to drive Stockfish crazy. <laughs> anyway, in the game, I played a more uh, human move, queen to d6. It's actually useful to connect rooks. A lot of people forget about this at the end of the opening, but it's one of the opening tasks to develop all the pieces, including your queen, so that the rooks are connected and now your position is in full harmony. All right, white played pawn to h3, attacking this bishop. So I dropped it back. Now bishop e3, white develops a bishop. Let me ask you to think about this position just as well. There is nothing special here, but anyway, how would you play here if you are black? It makes sense for black to play a couple of moves, like black would start advancing pawns in the center of the board or do something else, but I played the move rook to d8. And I learned this lesson the hard way many years ago. I remember I played a game against um, an international master and I lost it badly. And uh, at the end, my coach told me, Igor, don't you think that it's weird to play against an international master and to give him such huge odds? I said, like, what do you mean? He said, like, you never moved your rook from the corner. So it's almost as if you played without a rook, like you're playing all chess, you're just giving away a rook and you're playing against an international master, like that's weird. And therefore I learned the lesson, right? Never forget about this rook in the corner, always activate it. And so I play rook to d8. At this point, White would love to untangle his pieces because he's lacking the breathing space. And for that reason, he played knight to e1, offering an exchange of bishops, which would favor White, because usually when you have a cramped position, it's good for you to trade off some of your pieces so that you have more empty space to move around. But from my perspective, it's the opposite, and so I do want to save pieces on the board, and I went back bishop g6. Now Fabiano played bishop f3, put in a bishop to this active diagonal, so I played pawn to b6 just to make sure that my knight can move freely without worrying about this pawn left on b7. I played queen e2, developing a queen, now knight jumps forward to d4, and after this exchange, there's this little bit of a funny thing that these two pawns actually swapped around. I mean, I'm not sure if it's funny or not, but for a chess nerd like me, it is funny that this pawn actually used to stand on the d-file, and this pawn used to stand on the c-file, but they're kind of traded places somehow. Anyway, I played g3, just to provide this square for one of his pieces, and now it's time for black to do something constructive in the middle game. Once you developed all your pieces, you want to move forward and start attacking. So I played pawn to e5, Season space in the center, and hopefully trying to advance in the future. White played knight g2, pawn f5, and knight h4. 
In most cases, a knight on the rim is dim, but in this position, the knight is actually doing a good job here. It's putting pressure here, as well as to this pawn on f5, and white can at least trade it off, or maybe even use it for attack somehow. So that was a nice maneuver by white. So from e1, kind of from one edge, he relocated it to another edge of the board, but here it definitely stands a lot better. Now, normally black would wish to break through in the center with pawn to e4, but since white is controlling this square three times, I need more firepower there, so I played rook to e8, so that my rook can support this advancement. Uh, Fabiano anticipated pawn coming here to e4, and he made a prophylactic move, bishop back to g2, so that when my pawn goes forward, it does not hit the bishop anymore, which was nice by white. And now I'm playing e4 anyway, so now all my pieces are active, there is nothing else I can do to further improve activity of my pieces, and that's usually an indicator that it's time to go forward, because there's nothing else you can do really. And so I'm going pawn e4, but that's part of the plan anyway. After we developed all our pieces, it's time to move forward and hopefully create threats and develop attack. Or maybe blunder and lose, but whatever happens, right? that's just chess. Now, Fabiano traded on g6, I recaptured with a queen because I want to maintain the guard of this pawn on e4. And here there was also an interesting moment. Like, very often if you look at games of beginner level players, whenever there is an opportunity to exchange something, they always do that. If you look at stronger players, or especially those who are part of the Igor nation, they know that to take is a mistake. In most cases, it's actually beneficial for you to maintain the tension and let your opponent do the exchange. So he played rook to e1. And basically, why would love for black to trade here on d3. That would be a big mistake by black, because currently the main advantage of black's position is that thanks to the space advantage, thanks to this avalanche of pawns, like white's position is cramped, like he can't really move, right? If you look at all these pieces of white, they can't just move, there aren't that many squares where white could possibly go to. But if black trades on d3, that would eliminate the main black's advantage. And now after queen takes d3, white is just absolutely fine. Now his bishop is active, his no, not like that, like that. Now the rook is active, the queen is active, can jump around, and white's position is at least equal, maybe even better. So that's how one exchange can spoil the position completely. Now, of course, playing pawn to e3 would be a lot better for black. In this case, black would still try to keep attacking, but I wasn't sure how to proceed after that, if white just plays some awaiting move, king h1, or maybe king h2 is better, I guess. And uh, looks good for black, thanks to this pawn wedge but still I wasn't sure how to break through, and so I just played here, instead of pawn to e3, I played king h8. Kind of a useful and a waiting move. Um, I learned it actually from Karpov, one of the former world champs, uh, after looking at his games and reading his commentary, I noticed that some other guys, such as Kasparov or Fischer, they often used to think hard trying to find objectively the best move in a position. And Karpov often was like more pragmatic. If he wasn't sure what to do, he would just play some useful move such as King to H8, without burning time and letting his opponent to think hard about what to do now. Now Fabiano decided to take on E4, because he's got to do something. And here, I played Pawn to F4. So I do want to keep white pieces locked there behind the pawns so that they are completely inactive. Similar to the previous example, taking on e4 would be a big mistake by black, which would turn the situation around. After that, all of white pieces will become super active, all of his rooks, queens, plus he's got an extra pawn, and uh, that might be just winning for white, actually. Again, you can see how important it is to pay attention to the activity of pieces of yours as well as your opponent. So instead I played here pawn to f4. And now my pawn is attacking here, putting pressure, while his pieces got stuck behind his own pawns, and now his pawn on e4 is actually hampering his own activity. And because of that, his pieces are kind of dull, and they can't move around. Now, f4 puts pressure here, and white's position starts looking dangerous, because I'm attacking here on the king side, my queen is also pretty active. But here, uh, Fabiano, also known as Don Fabi, put off his cigar and looked me in the eyes, and said, you don't mess with Cosa Nostra, and played queen to d3. But I stayed cool, and I changed my pants, and played bishop e5, putting more pressure here, so that white has to do something. And of course, white does not want to open up the position that way, because that would completely expose his king, so he plays pawn g4, and that's the right move for white, definitely. If it was white to play here, white would love to play pawn to f3, and essentially turn it into checkers, if you look at the position right? But I didn't want to play checkers, so I played pawn to f3, which gives space for my bishop as well as my rook. So that's a positional pawn sacrifice, but it's quite interesting how in this position, for both sides, activity is more important than a pawn. Like, 
Potentially, White would love to just give up this pawn on e4 and free up the rest of his pieces, but he can't. Similarly for Black, Black would love to get rid of this pawn on f4 just so that the bishop as well as the rook are becoming very active and are ready to take part into the attack. So now play rook f4, just trying to stack rooks along this f file. And after bishop g2, I played rook to f8. Here White played f3 successfully, playing checkers, so I couldn't stop him from <laughs> doing that anyway. And now queen g5. I'm hoping to infiltrate with a queen somewhere, you know, this way or this way after the rook uh, moves away. He played rook d1, and now I'm going back rook to f6, so I'm vacating this square for the queen, hoping to go like this, and hopefully creating checkmating threats. And now Fabiano played pawn to f4, giving up the pawn, because he had too many, and due to the inflation, the value of a single pawn goes down, so he wants to get rid of it. I don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, I take here, and it turns out that White cannot really trade off the rooks, because if he does, then after queen takes, he actually helps me to play queen h2 with a checkmate. So I've got a battery here, and my rook cuts off the f-file. So although he sacrificed the pawn, but it didn't really help White to trade off material and to simplify his position. So he just played queen e2, and now pawn to h5. Notice that I'm still not taking here, again, to take is a mistake, my plan is not to trade off pieces and lead to a draw, but to keep attacking. So I'm going pawn to h5, trying to open up the g-file. And white cannot take, he played bishop h1 on the game. If he takes here, that allows my queen to enter forward, and after rooks come off the board, I'll play queen h2 still. After I trade rooks, so rook takes and queen h2 is coming, and white can't stop that. So white cannot take on h5, which means that white's position starts to crumble, he goes bishop h1, but now I can take here, and again it's problematic for white, he cannot recapture because then I recapture with a check and it looks deadly, so he played pawn to h4 trying to keep the position locked at least. So I'm taking with my queen, now he can take on f4, and after that I recapture, but still there are a lot of threats that I have got here with queen coming here, or if he moves away, you know, the queen can come to some other place, you know, I'm also attacking all around here with all my pieces, so actually there is no way for white to defend. At this point Fabiano decided to take a chance and played queen b5, attacking the bishop and threatening queen e8 check, just perhaps uh, deciding to take a chance because his position was losing anyway, but that fails because of queen f2 check made in one, so that's how the game ended. But there was also an interesting variation that didn't happen in the game, but could happen. If instead of queen to b5, let's say white decides to play some awaiting move, let's say he just does, does something, how can black make progress here? So the first move is pretty obvious, queen g3 check. Now he can't cover with the queen because we'll, my queen will come from this side and continue the attack, so bishop g2 looks more natural for white. And here's the question for you, so let it be our puzzle of the day. Of course black's got a strong attack here, but what is the quickest way for black to win? Please think about this, and if you can't find it, please write it down in the comments below. So I hope that, that you enjoyed this one, and I've got a quick question for you. I actually played the second game against uh, Caruana just as well, and I wasn't sure if you wish me to show it to you. It was a more positional game, like this one is more tactical, but you can vote for that. So please give a like if you want the continuation, and if this video gets 3000 likes, I will then record uh, the analysis of the second game that we played. And also, just to clarify, I'm not trying to brag or make it look like I'm playing better than Caruana. Of course, it's just a single game, and in a single game anything can happen. He's a great player, and nowadays I'm not even a competitive player, I'm rather a coach. So, just to make that clear. And finally, if you missed on my games against Carlson and Nakamura, which were also a lot of fun, I'll drop the links in the description below and maybe somewhere on the screen, so you can check them out right now if you're curious.